Our scripture this morning comes from the book of Luke, chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. And she came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken from her. The word of God for the people of God. Like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea pillows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well. my 
God. Where are you? Oh, there I see you on the back seat. My goodness, is you're here too. And even on the front. No, yes, that's a book. <laughs> but they're up here. Hallelujah. Does that sound reasonable? I see God in you. Actually, I haven't lost it. I'm trying to look beyond the, the, hum, <clears throat> the sense of human sight into the realm of the Spirit. And by faith, I see the fruit of the Spirit in you. The results of the Spirit working in your lives, in the lives of believers, Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I believe that to be true. What's also true is that we, like Martha and Mary, have different priorities. Some like to have people around them showing generous hospitality, enjoying the things that are relevant to the here and now. Others are more contemplative, being concerned with things of the Spirit, pleasing God more than self. Jesus, the central character of our message this morning, uh, observes both the external actions of Mary and Martha and looks beyond to the motivations that cause their differences and difficulties. We have the good fortune to study the characteristics and motivations of Mary and Martha and then apply those insights that we gain into our Christian walk, striving to be more like the Master finding and incorporating that one thing that is needful, the good part, that better thing, which cannot be taken away from us. Join me in prayer, please. Gracious God, we are here because we love you, and we want to draw closer to your side, to your will for our life, to understand the wisdom found in your word. Make us pliable, conforming to the spirit of your word rather than the letter of the law, wherein there is life eternal. Amen. Yes, drinking in church is permitted. When, excuse me, what was it like when Jesus walked among the common folks of his day? Luke records the ministry of Jesus, and one of the themes that he shows is that Jesus was a people person. As Jesus walks along the seashore, he calls fishermen to be his followers. His journey takes him through Galilee, where he proclaims the gospel in the synagogues, healing every disease and illness among the people. His fame spreads, prompting large crowds to follow him from Galilee, Jerusalem, Judea, and from across the Jordan. His travels and ministry established him as many things to many people. He was a healer, an amazing man, the God-man, in fact. Able to control the weather, he had pity on a man in the crowd whose son was demon-possessed. Jesus rebuked the evil spirit, 
healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. His exploits are recorded in the Gospels, addressing every aspect of life and culture and religion and philosophy. He had the ability to feed thousands, and he did it through your hands and mine, miraculously. He defies nature's laws by walking on water. And he experiences governmental authority, turning the then known world upside down by his preaching. That's our Jesus. The three people in the message today are Martha, Mary, and Jesus, the Son of God, the radical rabbi who was turning the world upside down with his preaching. After teaching throughout Galilee, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles. He spoke in Jerusalem and then visited his friends, Mary and Martha, in the tiny village of Bethany on the slope of the Mount of Olives. Verse 38 of Luke, chapter 10, indicates that his disciples were with him when he visited Mary and Martha. Martha now becomes responsible for the care and feeding of 13 people. Now, her chief concern is for her special guests, as would be correct, providing adequate accommodations, food, and especially hospitality, a strong social requirement in the culture at that time. It's still good. It's helpful to know some things about Martha's personality. Martha was known to be a person who had to make everything exactly right. I've heard that some wives are like that. She believed in Jesus with a growing faith and was an able and hospitable homemaker. Right or wrong, Martha expected others to agree with her priorities and felt that the power exhibited that the power Jesus exhibited was for this life only. She was overly concerned with details and tended to feel sorry for herself when her efforts were not recognized. Martha appears to be the older of the two women and certainly outspoken. When Lazarus died and Martha knew Jesus was coming, she rushed out to meet him and expressed her inner conflict of disappointment and hope. Jesus pointed out that her hope was too limited. He was not only Lord beyond death, he was Lord over death. He was the resurrection and the life. Moments later, Martha again spoke without thinking, pointing out, that a four-day-old corpse didn't smell very good. It had begun to decompose. Her awareness of details kept her from seeing the whole picture, but Jesus was patient with her, and he certainly is with us. Setting of this story is a dinner party. Dinner parties are well-suited for meeting the social needs of most people. It's a pleasure to be invited to someone's home that is willing to go through all of the work in preparing for such an event. There's cleaning to do. Don't we guys know that? My goodness. <laughs> There's food to cook. Uh, you gotta buy it first, of course. Probably extra chairs to borrow. And make certain that the guest list has the right mix of compatible people. We don't want opposing political, couple, ugh, political parties at our party, I don't think. We can presume certain things about Martha and her home. She was in charge. There is no reference in scripture to a man uh, as head of the household. Every aspect of great hospitality rested on her shoulders. From the gracious invitation to the order of the home to obtaining and preparing the food as well as serving each guest and seeing to their comfort. She was careful about every detail. She wanted to please. 
to serve, to do the right thing, to the extent she made those around her uncomfortable. She expected perfection. That made it hard for her to relax and enjoy her guests, even harder to accept Mary's lack of cooperation with all the prepared, uh, preparations. Her aggravation with Mary moved her to complain to Jesus, asking him to get Mary to help me serve. Come on, I can't do this all by myself. Jesus gently corrected her attitude and showed her that her priorities, though good, were not the best. The personal attention she gave to her guest should be more important than the comforts she provided. We do not know if Mary had been as involved in household preparations as Martha was. But having Jesus as a guest, he was already a close friend of the family. Mary thought differently. She may have seen things more on a spiritual level. After all, Mary had anointed the feet of Jesus with nard, an expensive perfume, and wiped them with her hair in this very home. The books of both Mark and John record Mary's love and devotion to Jesus in this tender scene, showing her spiritual strength and insight by preparing Jesus for the day of his burial. Some had objected to this apparent extravagant gesture, but Jesus said, leave her alone. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing for me. We are all alike, yet as different as night is from day. We are unique in our likes and dislikes, our physical makeup, and yet precious creations of the God of the universe. It's pretty straightforward. We understand the differences between Mary and Martha. Both personalities and their unique talents are needed. Gala events would not happen without careful preparation, place, purpose, and people. And no one would attend without the prospect of great food, service, and even entertainment. There are so many choices to make. When Jesus responded to Martha's complaint, he spoke both tenderly and clearly. Martha, Martha, you're worried and troubled about so many things. But one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen the good part, which will not be taken from her. Mary made a choice between two alternatives, listening to Jesus over preparation of a meal. Now, wait a minute. Isn't a meal a central idea to a good social gathering? Then we can visit. That certainly is what Martha probably thought. That was her most pressing need. Good food for Jesus and the disciples. Mary had chosen to listen to the wisdom of Jesus, her Savior, while she had the opportunity. We must listen to the wisdom of Jesus while we have the opportunity. Some of our choices are good and others not so good. The prophet Moses declared, I call heaven and earth to witness today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live. We have been privileged to see the personal interactive interactions of Jesus, Martha, and Mary and so what can we take from this dinner party will be, that will be helpful to us in our faith walk with Jesus? Consider the following points as we close this message. 
Being a gracious hostess or host to family and friends can make us very special people in their eyes. In seeking a balance for family and friends while neglecting our relationship with Jesus puts our souls in danger. It's not worth it. In Matthew 6, 33, probably a very familiar passage to many, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Our relationship to the Lord Jesus must be priority number one. The news and affairs of this world deserve our spirit-led prayers. To find the balance that exemplifies the Christian life, we must at times suspend the things of the world, things of a temporary nature that make certain of our eternal destiny. We do this by devoting ourselves to seasons of prayer and searching God's word for understanding and fulfilling his will for our lives. Should attention to our faith be set aside in favor of worldly matters, our work, our hobbies, our wonderful cars, and our boats? In light of the temporary nature of our sojourn, the most needful duty is to prepare to die. Sounds mournful, but it's true. Becoming a friend of Jesus and listening to his teachings. What ranks as priority one? Shall we give our affections to the pleasure of social gatherings, to feasting on the generous provisions of food and drink, to the close ties we enjoy in our circle of influence? With the ease of life provided by today's amazing technology and modes of transportation, again, the scripture gives us the direction and the answers we need. <clears throat> Psalm 27, verses 3 and 4 read, Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. And from Ecclesiastes, Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion to the matter. Fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. Amen.